Hello, Bill. This is the second part of the rise of modern Europe. Remember that I told you last class that this was the end of medieval ages. I have a confession for you. This is my favorite part of this moment in history. Why? Because this is what Renaissance is about. You know, improvements and development in science, in architecture, in music, in art, and in literature. And today we're going to discover who were those amazing people who were the pioneers in the things that we are able to enjoy nowadays in terms of technology and all types of art. It's going to be an amazing journey. Come with me. We're going to start with art, okay? And the first exponents are Michelangelo Buonarroti. It's this guy over here, okay? He's one of the greatest artists of all time. He was born in Italy. And his famous pieces of art are La Pietà, the Mercy in English, the David, which was in the cover of the presentation, and the Sistine Chapel in Italy too. Independent of patrons such Pope Julius III to create his sculptures, okay? It was not just paintings, but sculptures as well, okay? He was also the chief architect of St. Peter's Church in Rome, where the Pope lives right now. So his part in the history of Catholic religion, it's pretty important. I mean, it's so remarkable, you know? And he was also a first-rate poet, but his poems are not very well known. So I read or I learned uh, that it took for him 20 years to develop the Sistine Chapel. And that left as a consequence that he had back problems, for example. He died young because of all this injuries that he got at the end, I mean, all the problems, the diseases he got from that period. The next one is Rafael Sancio. Rafael Sancio was also a great painter and architect, and he was born in Italy as well. His famous pieces of art are Sistine Madonna, the School of Athens, which is in the previous presentation, and Raphael Rooms, that is a series of paintings that tell a story in a place in a, in a church. His influence in Renaissance art was very important, along with Michelangelo's and Da Vinci's. And he left many unfinished works, and the students of his school tried to finish them adopting his style, but they remained as cheap copies of his work because nobody could think like him, actually. He was very young when he died. He was 37 years old, but he left a large art collection that can be still seen in several museums all around it and in other places as well. These are the other two, Donatello. Donatello was a great Italian sculptor and he was the one to first to reach back to ancient Rome for inspiration. And his sculpture were so perfect that the carved faces seemed to be alive. He had the custom to talk to his sculptors once they were finished. And it was so weird because it looked like crazy talking to a marble statue, for example, you know? His style of sculpting was based on emotional strength and particular sense of movement. They seemed to be alive. It was amazing, the carving process for him, you know? In fact, he started to do plays with his, with his sculptors and people looked at him like, are you crazy? <laughs> okay, Rembrandt. Rembrandt was Dutch. He was born in the Netherlands. The story of Rembrandt was, was not so easy because unlike Michelangelo, he did not have the support of the church because his style of painting was more like to represent what's going on in life and even represent scenes that 
are not supposed to be shelved, you know, that are supposed to be in the anonymity. So the church didn't like pretty much his style. But on the other hand, the rich merchants asked him to do portraits of him. So it wasn't that bad for him after all. He took his chance to play a range of emotions and personality based on the faces of the rich merchants. And he painted as well 60 self-portraits in which he shows his changing through time. Pretty much uh, uh, at the style of Frida Kahlo. If you see the paintings of Frida Kahlo, you will see the influence of Rembrandt in her paintings because she reflects herself in different periods of her life. And that's what he did. He reflected yeah. different periods of his life when he was painting. In fact, in one of the paintings, he uh, illustrated the death of one of his sons. It is, it's a pretty sad painting. But this one over here is called Anatomy Class. And it's very real, what is shown here. But, the man, the one and only, was this guy over here, Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was pretty much a genius. He was ahead of his time. He was a multitasking person. I mean, he was a painter, he was a sculptor, he was an architect, he was an engineer, he was a scientist and an inventor. He was born in Italy too. I mean, the influence of Italian artists at that moment was even more important than Greek artists. In fact, Greek artists did not commit their lives to do many things. So the Italians took over, you know? And this guy was one of the most amazing and mesmerizing artists of his time. And his scientific sketches of the human body are also works of art. I mean, he had a pretty much clear idea of what the body was like on the outside and in the inside. So, it, it, I mean, he didn't, it didn't take for him to study much anatomy in order for him to figure out what was going on there. So, come on, brilliant, you know? He designed many remarkable things, such as the first machine gun. Imagine that. I mean, not bullet by bullet, but many bullets at one time. I mean, pretty destructive, but groundbreaking, you know? The first adjustable monkey wrench. I mean, to squeeze things and adjust things, you know, pegs, holes, I mean, amazing. A machine for cutting threads in crews. The first design for an airplane. He was one of the first who put on paper that flying was possible for humans using a machine. The first design for a tank that later on was developed and put in march in World War I. Imagine that. And the first design for a submarine. Can we live underwater? He asked. Yes, we have to design a structure that could protect us from the water pressure at a very big depth. And I think it's possible. We have to regulate the amount of air, he thought. So it eventually came true. And of course, this is his most famous painting, the Mona Lisa. This is the symbol of art everywhere. It is located in France, in the Museum of Blue, and it's seen for millions and millions of people every year from all over the world. So his legacy is timeless and is extremely important in the history of our society as humans. Now, we got to the part of science. These people had a hard time because they wanted to prove so many things that were going on around them. He and he 
we're trying to prove what was going on in the universe. And they tried to prove that everything had an explanation in the world. Not all, not all was creation of God, but many people didn't believe him and they had to suffer harsh consequences because of this reason, you know? The first one was Nikolaus Copernicus. He was Polish. He's from Poland, or he was from Poland. And he had to become an astronomer because he had his head in the stars. He studied religion and math, medicine, but most of it, astronomy. Astronomy was his thing, you know? And using mathematical models, he determined that all the planets orbited around the sun. At that moment, according to his studies, there were only six planets, not nine. But those six planets revolve around the sun. I mean, in, in this, with this thought, he tried to prove that, guys, not everything is God's creation. I mean, the sun is the main star and all the planets, the planets spin around them, you know? And that model of the heliocentric solar system shocked leaders of the Catholic Church. They didn't agree with them because they had the thought that God created everything. So he was accused of witchcraft and he was banned from the church. And I mean, he was banished. It was pretty awful for him, you know, to try to prove his theories. The other one is Galileo Galilei. He was born in Italy. No, Italy, the center of Renaissance. He made observations with his new telescope. Look at this beauty of telescope. Isn't it great? Amazing. And with this telescope, he could prove, and he was convinced eventually that Copernicus model was right. And despite his reputation as a scientist and astronomer, the church also condemned him for supporting Copernicus. He was accused of witchcraft, you know, well, that's about time, you know? But today, however, everyone had to accept that Actually, Earth revolved around the sun, just as the rest of the planets. And that is, that is why we already have a model of how the solar system works in the universe. Okay? So, these people are geniuses. These are other amazing scientists and thinkers of their time. The first one is Blaise Pascal. He was born in France, and he was only 21 when he developed the world's first digital calculator. Imagine that, 21 years old. He also invented the hypodermic scrunch to get shots, you know, now the vaccines, you know, <laughs> and the hydraulic press. And he was highly respected for his writings in philosophy and religion. I mean, at that moment, it was very remarkable to see how these people specialized in so many fields of knowledge. And the one and only Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton, an English physicist, biologist, alchemist, inventor, mathematician, come on. He was a brilliant mind, a beautiful mind. And from his fertile mind came the understanding of light. Imagine that, the prism and the colors and the light and the darkness, you know. He was the one who started to study about this phenomenon of light. The law of gravity, the three laws of motion. He was the one that according to a legend that states that an apple fell over his head, started to think, why do things fall? Is there a force pulling us from the bottom? Is there something pushing from above? 
what is that? And the word gravity emerged from his mind. Imagine that. Literature. This was the golden age of literature. The most remarkable and emotional and analytic writers of all eras emerge in this time of Renaissance. The first one, the first one was Niccolo Machiavelli. Machiavelli was born in Florence, Italy, and he wrote this book, The Prince. And he had dealings with the Pope at first, the kings of France and Germany and several Italian princesses when Italy was a monarchy. Italy is not a monarchy anymore. This book, The Prince, was born in 1513, and it was based on what he had learned about politics in Italy, which was not pretty good, according to his thought, you know? Uh, this book has continued to inspire discussion because it talks about ambition and how many politicians talk about what it takes in order to get power. In fact, there is a, very, a famous phrase taken from that book that states, the ends justifies the means. And that means that no matter what you have to do in order to achieve your goals. Some people could say, oh, that's ambitious. I mean, that is not a bad thing, but how much are you willing to sacrifice? Or how many people are you willing to step over in order to get what you want? So it's a, it's a struggle with moral, you know? So that is why this book is so controversial. On the other hand, there is this romantic guy over here. This is Spanish guy called Miguel de Cervantes. Miguel de Cervantes created 2,000 words from Spanish language. So many of the things that we say daily come from him. And he wrote this amazing book that is a reference in any work of art in Spanish literature, Don Quixote de la Mancha. This book is also a very optimistic, optimistic story because it tells a story about Don Quixote who was in love with a girl named Dulcinea del Toboso and he decided to become a knight to fight dragons and beasts. But it turns out that his enemies were the windmills. Imagine that. So he had a psychic, a person who was next to him, called Sancho Panza, who was always trying to make him come back to reality. Don Quixote, that's not true. A windmill cannot be your enemy, you know? <laughs> well, but this novel was so successful, it has been translated to, to so many languages, and it is one of the most important and beautiful and written pieces of literature ever. I mean, it's an everlasting story. Let's continue. But, you know, this is the English opposite of Cervantes. This is the one and only William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare was something else because he had so many things in mind about human behavior. Not only romance, but power, but uh, pretending, but jealousy and fear and willing to do different things. I mean, William Shakespeare was an English writer. He was a playwright, okay? And his books are timeless. They remain here till this days, okay? And he wrote tragedies, comedies, histories, and they were represented. For, I mean, they have been represented for all these years. 
in many levels. I mean, professional theater, high school, elementary, his quotes are famous all over the world. I mean, and he was also a great inventor of words and phrases. I mean, Shakespeare has the credit for inventing other words that are not part of the English vocabulary. You see? And the characters in tragedies were, were always doomed to death. I mean, in the tragedies, the endings for the protagonists were always fatal, you know? And the characters in comedy had mistaken identities, women disguised as men, as in Twelve Night, letters, and weddings. These are four of his famous books, Romeo and Juliet, Macbeth, Otello, The Taming of the Shrew. This is a comedy. And there are others. There is one that is called As You Like It, that is also a comedy. There is another a book called Hamlet, King Lear. I mean, there are so many things to be written by Shakespeare. The stories mostly tell the stories of kings and nobles in exciting situations, such as rebellion or war. He was very patriotic. I mean, he was pretty identified with the ideas of the monarchy at that time. He was a supporter of it, you know? And his books have been turned into many award-winning movies and TV shows. They have won the Oscar, the Academy Award, and, you know, many other awards, okay? That's it. As you can see, this was a marvelous time for creation. I hope you liked it and I'll see you next class. Thank you. Bye.